Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here this morning. Sorry, it's a little bit stuffy. Somebody didn't turn on the air conditioner uh, quick enough. We're not used to this, uh, this temperature yet, you know. Amy's got her fan. We don't all have one. Did you bring one for everybody? <laughs> But it's okay. Uh, we're taking care of it, and heads will roll because this happened. So, uh. <laughs> hey, we're going to start off uh, this morning uh, with an invocation by Pastor Michelle McGee from Palm United Methodist Church in Dinuba. Uh, and feel free to stand with us if you would like, and then we'll just remain standing for the flag salute afterwards. And that will be led by Supervisor Vanderpool. Good morning, Chair, Supervisors, and other citizens of Tulare County. It's an honor to be with you today. Just two notes before I pray. One, um, while I believe in Jesus Christ, I know not everyone in Tulare County believes the same. So I'm going to offer an expansive prayer that I hope those of many faiths can be comfortable joining. And also, as close to half of Tulare County residents have Spanish as their first language, and because I can, I'll be offering my prayer bilingually. For this prayer is for this meeting and for you all as you serve, but it's also for those whom you serve in this county. I invite you to be in a prayerful attitude with me. Oremos. Holy One, source of life and hope, fuente de vida y esperanza, Gracias por estos siervos civiles y su compromiso para el bien común. Thank you for these civil servants and their commitment to the common good. We pray for this meeting today and always, for your wisdom, patience, and to listen well to one another. Pedimos tu sabiduría, paciencia, y poder escucharnos bien. Help us through decisions we make to care for all, especially the most vulnerable. Ayúdanos a través de las decisiones que tomemos hoy a cuidar a todos, especialmente los más vulnerables. May all we do lead to true justice and peace for all. Que todo lo que hagamos nos lleva hacia la verdadera justicia y paz para todos y todas. Que tu presencia, fuente de vida, esté en medio nuestro. May your presence, O source of life, be in our midst. Amen. Thank you. Please join me in saluting our nation's flag. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you, and you may be seated. And we're going to continue this morning with our Board of Supervisors matters, and I think I'll start down there with Supervisor Vanderpool. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. I've uh, been a busy uh, few weeks. I uh, wanted to uh, highlight from a meeting I attended and chaired yesterday of the Kings Tulare Area Agency on Aging. That meeting was held in uh, Kings County at the Corcoran Senior Center. Uh, we had a, a great attendance. That was great to see. Uh, CSET gave an update, talked about their senior day in the park, and that was a fantastic event for anyone who made it out there. Uh, I hope everyone did. It was great weather and uh, great resources, lots of uh, seniors out there. Uh, but I thought it was just as impressive the number of youth who were out there uh, to additionally uh, assist and provide uh, uh, help and uh, support to the senior population. Uh, CSET commented yesterday that of the eight senior centers that they operate uh, in Tulare County, five of the eight have reopened post-COVID. Uh, that is important because uh, each of those centers has to be staffed by a CSET employee, um, and it takes a very special person to staff these senior centers. Uh, actually, uh, Lindsay will be reopening very soon. Uh, and I did ask which senior center receives the largest attendance uh, post-COVID reopening, and that senior center is actually the smallest physically, uh, but it is located in the community of Early Mart that has the uh, largest attendance of the eight centers they operate. This week, couple of uh, public meetings. Uh, the audit committee meets this Thursday at 10 o'clock. 
Um, there will be a, a follow-up event to an event that took place last week, which was the Allensworth Flood Resource Fair. That went really well. We had an incredible turnout of residents, uh, and I want to thank all the county uh, departments and uh, all the various uh, partners that we have from FEMA, uh, the state, Everyone came together to put on a fantastic event uh, out there, and, and special thanks to Patrick Burks, who really worked hard uh, organizing that. And uh, we've got that same uh, format and type of event happening uh, on Thursday in Alpa. Um, this Saturday, the Tulare Hospital Foundation will be having their summer jubilee at Zumwalt Park in Tulare. That starts at 6 o'clock. And uh, the Tulare, uh, in the community of Tulare, there's a new church that will be opening um, and will be officially blessed on Tuesday at 2 o'clock, and that is St. Rita's. Their new church is located over by uh, Mission Oak High School, um, and that will be a wonderful event and will be uh, serving the community there as well. So uh, that's all I had that I wanted to cover today, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. We'll go to Supervisor Shucklian. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A few things I want to highlight from last week. Uh, again, thank you and congratulations to Eagle Mountain Casino in Porterville. They had their grand opening, and it, it certainly was grand. So uh, best of, of luck to them and, and continued success. I also attended uh, the source unveiling of their new uh, remodeled community center. Uh, seven years they've been doing this for the community and providing excellent services. So uh, thank you to the source and for all the partnerships that they have uh, with the county. I also uh, attended and was able to present at the Kuia Starlight Awards to their uh, Employee of the Year, which uh, is a good friend of mine, and actually her husband is in the back. Uh, assistant, are you assistant chief now? Is that what he is, Lindy? Okay, Assistant uh, Chief uh, Greg White, so congratulations. Uh, I also attended the CASA event Friday night, and hopefully a lot of money was raised for a good cause there. Tomorrow we have our Homeless Task Force meeting at 1.30. I just want to remind folks that this is always uh, live streamed on Facebook, so anybody can join in, uh, make comments, and see all the great things that are happening in Tulare County. Uh, with the different cities and organizations for folks experiencing homelessness. Thursday, I have an air board meeting, and then in the evening, I will be serving at the Armenian Food Festival. Friday, I get to throw out the first pitch at the Rawhide Game for Mental Health Awareness Night, and then it's off to Happy Trails for their fundraiser. I encourage folks to go downtown Visalia on Saturday for the car show, and then on Sunday, Imagine You will be having the unveiling of their new SHIELD exhibit, which is a first responder exhibit, and the um, museum is free that day. I believe it's from 11 to 2, so if you've never taken your kids uh, to Imagine You, I encourage you to do that. And that's all, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. We'll go to Supervisor Valero. Right. Well, good morning, Tulare County. Um, last weekend, I attended the Woodlake Lions Club Rodeo, the parade, and then the Kiwanis Breakfast. Um, I want to thank Chief Norman and Captain Castillo for your help with Fire Engine 1, as it's always a treat having this truck in our local parades. Surprisingly, this was my first time attending the rodeo, and now I know why this is a tradition everyone enjoys. I started my morning that day with a delicious pancake bref breakfast held annually by the Woodlake Kiwanis Club, for which I am a member of. Our KT AAA meeting, as a Supervisor Vanderpool mentioned, went very well yesterday. Thank you to Vanderpool for leading that meeting and uh, chairing this year. I always, always great to hear uh, about the wonderful things happening across both counties with respect to our seniors. Excited to know that our senior centers are opening up again with the majority already uh, open. I'm also thankful about the recent increase in funding uh, to support programming and development. Uh, in addition to TCAG, I participated in our uh, Tulare County Regional Transportation Agency meeting last night. We approved a consultant hire, discussed our financial situation, and worked through a few operational concerns. Um, after this meeting and our employee appreciation luncheon this afternoon, I will be flying to Utah to attend the NACO Western Interstate Regional Conference. And so tomorrow, 
I will be participating in the Environment, Energy and Land Use and Agricultural Policy Steering Committee's mobile tour, and that is to see the Washington uh, County Water Conservancy Conservancy District. So this tour will um, include visits to some of the most critical diversion dams and reservoirs that produce more than 60 million gallons of water per day for 200,000 residents in rural and urban communities. I will also be attending sessions like weathering weather whiplash, ensuring sustainable water supply in the face of record drought and flooding, and then leading in times of crisis and securing the electric grid in the face of extreme weather. And then after this conference, I will be heading over to San Diego for our annual Latino Caucus of California Counties Board Retreat this weekend. And that is all I have, Chair. Thank you. And we will go to Vice Chair McCarry. Well, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to hope everyone had a happy Mother's Day and enjoyed that time with your family. And uh, it's always a special day. Uh, second, Greg, congratulations. I just heard about your promotion, so I want to congratulate you. I worked with Greg many long, many years, and uh, it was always a pleasure. Uh, this last week was really busy. I was out of town most of it. Um, we had our night meeting on Tuesday, and then uh, there was a special Vice Cemetery District meeting that I was invited to come so they could have a meeting with me regarding some concerns that they had and some uh, thing, projects they were working on. I then left and I drove to Butte County where I spent the remainder of the week at the Rural Counties representing California Conference. Uh, we had the Golden State Finance Authority and the Golden State Connect meetings, uh, board meetings that were there. I'm an alternate for Supervisor Townsend who had to uh, uh, represent us in Washington, D.C. So I attended that. Uh, we toured, toured Oroville Dam and it's, we heard that, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at now, instead of these dams being just strictly flood control, being more water conservation. So the state was heavily involved up there. Hopefully that'll catch and it starts spreading through our state and we can uh, work on some more water conservation uh, issues that we have. Uh, I returned late. Actually, I drove straight down here, came to the office, changed clothes, and went to the CASA event. And uh, it was a great event, and we enjoyed that. And I got to see a lot of people, and got to <clears throat> hopefully they did uh, very were very successful in their fundraising opportunities. It's always great to support them. Uh, yesterday was the KT AAA meeting, as it was discussed, and then we had our TCAG workshop and our meeting all afternoon. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Vice Chair. And uh, yeah, as the Vice Chair uh, mentioned, uh, uh, Speaker McCarthy had, had sent an invitation uh, for me to go to Washington, D.C. to testify uh, on the Save Our Sequoias Act, uh, which is specifically for the, the giant sequoias, uh, mostly, uh, mostly right, most of my, my district, we're right here in Tulare County. And uh, so we have, we have 60 of the of the 69 or 70 groves, we have 60 of them in Tulare County. And so this is an act to, uh, to go in and to do some forest uh, management around those groves to uh, try to keep, we lost 20% of them, 20% uh, of the mature giant sequoias in the two fires back to back. And so that brought national attention to the area. So the speaker tried to run the bill last year, uh, didn't go, so he, now that he's speaker, uh, he's, he's gonna run it so to, so hopefully it'll, uh, it'll get passed this time, but it was a, a real privilege um, to represent the county uh, there at that uh, congressional hearing. And uh, I want to thank uh, Israel Sotelo, our, our chief of staff, especially for uh, just kind of dropping everything at, uh, last week and uh, helping uh, prepare the notes and the testimony that had to be turned in on uh, early Monday morning. And so yeah, he worked over the weekend. And so thank you for that, Israel. And uh, also uh, Mike Steck from uh, HHSA on the video because we had a video playing uh, in the background that was very effective. They had put together the video for me a couple of years ago after the fires. And then he took that 20 minute video, edited it down to a five minute video without audio uh, and put some other effects on it that were, uh, that were used to really good effect with the committee showing managed forest and a lesser managed forest and what happened uh, in the fire. So very, very effective. Um, so, so thanks to, uh, to Israel, to Mike for getting out already. Thanks to Speaker McCar uh, McCarthy for, uh, for the invitation. Um, also was, had a chance to uh, visit with some of the bill's co-sponsors. So I, I sat down with uh, Congressman David Valadeo, uh, Congressman Jim Costa, uh, and Congressman uh, John Duarte, who are uh, co-sponsors of that bill. The next day, uh, we were able to go over on the Senate side so that if a bill makes it through uh, the House, that 
trying to do a little preparation for it to get to the Senate. Uh, I was able to meet with the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, the staff, the two staffers that put that together. One was uh, Senator Manchin's uh, representative and one was Senator Barrasso's uh, uh, representative. So that was a great meeting. And then afterwards, that was followed up with Senator Feinstein's uh, staff, who had prepared her bill uh, last, last time around. And so trying to uh, work out some compromises there ahead of the, the time that the actual bill gets there. And also the same thing with Senator uh, Padilla's staff. And interestingly, ran into our uh, Tulare County Association of Governments uh, delegation that was over there uh, uh, doing their Washington uh, trip, their Valley Voice trip uh, at the same time. And while I was in <clears throat> uh, Congressman Costa's office, uh, they had the meeting right afterwards. And so uh, after we visited with the Congressman, he asked that I would stay in. Uh, so I had a, had a, a double whammy there, uh, getting, to, getting to talk to him about uh, some transportation issues as well. Uh, and also, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Supervisor Shucklian. Uh, she covered the Eagle Mountain Casino uh, opening, and uh, at last minute, <laughs> yeah, it was really tough. You know, it was kind of, I was like, let's see, who can we ask to do that? Uh, oh, I, let's ask Supervisor Shucklian. And, uh, and also, especially Vice Chair uh, Macari, because, I mean, he really rearranged his schedule uh, to make that trip happen. He did the police officer uh, memorial ceremony. Um, he took the board meeting, uh, the night meeting out in Woodville. And, uh, and then I asked him to go to uh, uh, rural county representatives of California up in, uh, up in Chico. And as he mentioned, that, uh, that kind of really impacted his schedule. So thank you so much, uh, you two, for, for helping out with that. Uh, tomorrow, I'll have an uh, Ag Advisory Committee meeting, going to, to meet with them on, a, on an issue that we've been uh, talking about for a while to get their input. And then uh, this weekend is Portable Fair, actually starting... Uh, starting tomorrow, so Wednesday through Sunday, uh, but on uh, Saturday I'll be out there on the bid for the kid trying to help those 4-H uh, uh, those, uh, and FFA uh, kids with that auction. And that is all that I have. And we will go to, all right, next is to present a proclamation recognizing May 6th through 12th, 2023 as National Nurses Week in Tulare County. And so, Stacy, is that gonna be you? Okay, we'll have Stacy Chastain come up, and if you want to say a few words before I read the, uh, pro the proclamation, and then we will take some pictures together. Absolutely. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Supervisors, Mr. CAO, and Ms. County Council. My name is Stacey Chastain, and I'm Deputy Director for the Public Health Branch at HHSA. And as mentioned, I am here this morning in honor of Nurses Week, which takes place the very first full week of May every year. It coincides with Florence Nightingale's birthday, which is May 12th. And it's a time for all of us to just reflect on all of the amazing work that our nurses are doing at Health and Human Services Agency for the community of Tulare County. Um, last week, uh, in order to recognize our nurses, we did hold a nice luncheon for them. Um, there were some different activities, uh, networking activities, because there are over 80 nurses that work for Health and Human Services Agency throughout the various branch and programs. Um, and then these nurses were able to attend a training in which they could get uh, continuing education credits. So it was just a really great event. The weather was perfect that day. It was held at our Visalia Healthcare Center. Um, and it was just nice to see all of the nursing staff out there uh, networking and uh, just reflecting on all of the positive things that they're doing for our community. Um, uh, you know, it's no shock to everybody that there's a shortage of nurses here in Tulare County and across the state in general. So the fact that these nurses choose to work and spend their time here in Tulare County at Health and Human Services Agency is just a really big honor. Um, and we're grateful for all of the work that they do. They are serving children, families, the underserved, and just individuals that are facing things that are difficult. And so I just want to say um, thank you. I know that there are some nurses here today, so hopefully we'll be able to do a photo op with them after we read the proclamation. But on behalf of the leadership for HHSA, we want to say thank you to all of our nurses and recognize them for National Nurses Week. Very good. Thank you, Stacy. And, and yeah, it has become very, uh, uh, over the past couple of few years especially, uh, you know, I think our general awareness of of nurses and what nurses do and uh, and how uh, what short supply that they're in has really come to the fore. So uh, it's very appropriate to, to do this this recognition. So I'll read the proclamation and then we will have all of them come up uh, that would want to get in the picture afterwards. So this is a proclamation recognizing May 6th through 12th, 2023 is National Nurses Week in Tulare County, whereas May 6th has been observed as the first day 
of National Nurses Week since President Ronald Reagan's National Proclamation 1982 and is a time for the community to recognize the vast contributions and positive impacts that nurses make on the lives of others. And whereas this year's theme is You Make a Difference, which honors the varying nurses' roles as well as the positive impact nurses have in our communities. And whereas nurses in the United States constitute our nation's largest healthcare profession, and over 80 nurses uh, are employed by Tulare County, and whereas the depth and breadth of the nursing profession meet the differ different and emerging health care needs of Tulare County's population in a wide range of settings, and whereas the nurses in Tulare County are working diligently to address health access and create healthier communities by advancing the well-being of individuals and families through their work, and whereas the nursing profession, often described as an art and a science, embraces dedicated individuals with varied interests and strengths united in their passion and commitment to their patients and to improving the quality of health care. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors does hereby recognize the week of May 6th through 12th, 2023 as National Nurses Week in Tulare County and calls upon all residents to recognize the crucial role nurses play in the health and well-being of all Tulare County residents, not just during this week, but at every opportunity throughout the year, dated May 16th, 2023, and is signed by Vice Chair Larry McCarry, Supervisor Pete Vanderpool, Supervisor Amy Shecklian, Supervisor Eddie Valero, and myself, Chair Dennis Townsend. And let's go ahead, let's give them a hand for that, by the way. Yeah. And then we'll invite everyone to, uh, to come up and take a photo along with the board. You'd like to say something? <coughs> yeah. I, all right. Yes, Supervisor Valero. Again, yes, I'd just like to say thank you again to all of our nurses. Um, as we've witnessed over the past few years, you were a critical piece to the livelihoods of everyone who was going through challenges and situations. And so, uh, again, just appreciate you and your expertise and your willingness to serve and make sure that people live better lives and healthier lives as well. So thank you. Thank you. All right, and with that, we will move on to uh, item number three, recognition of Tulare County employees who have been selected by their respective departments to be honored in the Employee Recognition Program and announce and select the 2022 Tulare County Employee of the Year. And for this item, we have HRD Director Lupe Garza. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Let me just get my PowerPoint here. Um, Well, good morning, Chairman Townsend, Vice Chair McCarry, members of the board, Mr. Britt, Ms. Flores. It gives me great pleasure to bring before you employees who are being recognized for their exceptional service to the County of Tulare. The Employee Recognition Program was created as a way of recognizing employees who have performed in a manner that exemplifies dedication and commitment to public service. This could be one of specific act of extra, extraordinary service or a continual commit, commitment of dedicated service. Employees are nominated within their department. They take into consideration the employee's productivity, efficiency, and performance level, 
willingness, willingness to accept new responsibilities, contributions to morale, extraordinary service, and attendance record. There were 137 selected for 2022. Those selected received a certificate of appreciation presented by the employee's department head and received an additional eight hours of vacation leave. Each recipient is also automatically um, nominated for the County of the Employee of the Year. The Employee of the Year will be, pre will be presented with a plaque and will receive an additional 40 hours of vacation leave. Additionally, their picture, will, picture and write-up will be included in the County's Grapevine newsletter. And I would like to invite Chairman Townsend and or um, Vice Chair Makari to um, help me present the nominees of this year's Employee of the Year. Yes, and I believe there yep, certificates right there. Okay, so um, I ask the nominees that they call your name to please come forward and um, board members here will present you with a certificate. The first nominee is Anthony Benitez from the District Attorney's Office. Investigator Benitez has moved, to the, has moved the digital forensic unit forward in leaps and bounds to stay relevant and current with digital evidence, which seems to change almost from day to day. In this day and age, we are in an unprecedented time where fraud can be committed over the in internet from the other side of the planet, a time where someone can literally commit a crime or hold a company hostage and not be present. The challenges that face a digital forensic examiner are nothing short of incredible. Investigator Benitez has in the past and continues to step up to the task and has made Tulare County District Attorney's Office Digital Forensic Unit a light in the darkness where members of the public and law enforcement agencies can go when they need help the most. This is just a small blurb of what was written about um, Mr. Benitez. So, um, Supervisor um, Townsend has a certificate for you. Yeah, congratulations. And uh, I'll read this off and give this to you. Oh, we'll have gonna, a, oh, 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 wrong one, wrong one. <laughs> How do you want to do it? You want to wait? Thank you. So the second, the second anyway, one. Anyway, congratulations. <laughs> um, second is we, we rehearsed this. We rehearsed this for hours. I don't know. I don't know what went wrong. <laughs> Allison Pierce is a positive force for. Um, th this is a blurb also from the County Council um, Department. Allison is a positive force for for our team, our clients, and the office. She is friendly, willing to assist, and takes her role of advisor very seriously. Allison can handle whatever comes her way. She consistently, consistently meets her deadlines, and numerous clients have expressed their appreciation for responsiveness and work product. So Allison Pierce. All right, Allison. Congratulations. Come on up. I'll read this to you, and then we'll do a little quick photo op. How about that? Unless you want it. you have a speech? Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, certificate of recognition presented to Allison K. Pierce in honor of being recognized as a 2022 Employee of the Year finalist. Thank you for your continued commitment and service to the residents of Tulare County. Here you go. Congratulations. Come on back here. Congratulations. That was smoother. Yeah. I'm so sorry. We're getting there. <laughs> we got it down, that's right. Next, we have Kenneth Page from the Sheriff's Office. Kenneth, Ken, they call him Ken. This is a blur from his department. Ken's years of, ex, years of experience and knowledge as a dispatcher continuously show in his work, not only as a dispatcher, but as a shift supervisor. He quickly reacts to questions from staff. He consistently portrays a positive outlook and attitude. Ken very rarely calls in sick for his shifts. He's extremely reliable and will come to work on a, on a minute's notice. He also volunteers to fill in when there are shifts that need to be filled. His positive attitude and humorous demeanor make working with him a pleasure. So Mr. Kenneth Page, if you can please join up. Okay, Ken, come on up.
Congratulations. <laughs> and I will read this to you, and then we'll get a, we'll get a picture here. A certificate of recognition presented to Kenneth Page in honor of being recognized as a 2022 Employee of the Year finalist. Thank you for your continued commitment and service to the residents of Tulare County. Congratulations. Come on up here. Okay, next nominee is David Rodriguez from Health and Human Services Agency. David, um, I'm sorry. David Rodriguez is, a, is very efficient when it comes to his programs of oversight. He is up to date on RFA written directives, and when he was overseeing another CWS program manager's oversights due to a retirement, he assessed and identified some concerns with the AB 12 ILP program, which I'm sure he knows what that means, I don't, which alerted executive management to look further into this area. David ensured to have the supervisor and lead worker to start addressing those concerns, and they worked together on an action plan to ensure timely submittal of reports. These are just a few words from what was written from his department. So David, could you please join us? Oh. Ah. Okay. <laughs> so we can please... Um, we will get, yeah. we'll, we'll, get, we'll get this to him. From, to and receiving board. the award for David Rodriguez <laughs> is <laughs> Jennifer Fox. Okay. <laughs> One more second, just looking for the next person. Next nominee is Jessica Moncada from Probation. Jessica was nominated. She is, um, I believe now she's gone from a probation, from a regular employee to an extra help, but she was a regular full-time employee back in 2022. What, she, what was written for her is Jessica, um, they are nominating Deputy Probation Officer Jessica Moncada for an Employee Recognition Award. Officer Moncada has Officer Moncada has been a dedicated officer to the department for almost 10 years. She has recently been assigned to her first field supervision unit and has been exceptional in her transition to, in the, to the 678 unit. A few more words. Officer Moncada arrives to work daily and displays a positive attitude. She is considerate and respectful of her peers and of her assigned clients. Officer Moncada has displayed active listening skills and a willingness to understand other people's points of view. She consistently promotes cooperation and harmony within the team and is always happy to assist a colleague when asked, even when she had already planned out her day. Officer Makata has been noticed to provide quality service to her clients and the community. She has ensured the schedules a newly assigned client for a CIS, CAIS assessment as soon as reasonably possible. Officer Makata is committed to meeting with clients monthly or more if necessary. If given a task by, super, by her supervisor, Officer Makata has taken on the task and completed it in a timely manner. So Officer Makata. All right, congratulations. <laughs> and this certificate of recognition is presented to Jessica Mankata in honor of being recognized as a 2022 Employee of the Year finalist. Thank you for your continued commitment and service to the residents of Tulare County. And if you could come on up. Next is Clarissa Alvarez from Probation. Officer Alvarez has demonstrated leadership skills as she was managing all caseloads for the non-custody intake unit. She maintained a positive attitude and was willing to accept new responsibilities. She made sure all reports and calls were made, calls were, were handled in a timely manner. Officer. Officer Alvarez went above and beyond the normal expectations. Officer. Very good, congratulations. <laughs> we have a certificate of recognition presented to Clarissa Alvarez in honor of being recognized as a 2022 Employee of the Year finalist. Thank you for your continued commitment and service to the residents of Tulare County. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Our last nominee is Anita Spaulding from Human Resources and Development. She is not with us today, but I'll still read a little bit about her nomination. Uh, Ms. Spaulding, was, um, she's a Human Resources Analyst um, one. We feel Ms. Spaulding exemplifies the spirit of public service and as a role model for personal and professional achievement. In recent years, Ms. Spaulding had worked her full-time job as a human resources technician, taking care of her family, and went back to school to obtain her bachelor's degree in business administration with certification in human resources management. Ms. Spaulding earned her degree in 2018. With this achievement, Ms. Spaulding was promoted to a human resources analyst one in 2020. In this role, she successfully contributed to the work of department in the areas of recruitment, special projects, and job class development. Ms. Spaulding takes on active role in community service. In 2019, she underwent training with the City of Visalia to be a volunteer in police services. On her own time, she volunteers at public events such as parades to assist with crowd safety. She assists with traffic control and traffic accidents, and she engages the public at Visalia Police Department outreach events. So with this, we, were, we nominated Ms. Anita Spaulding for, this, for the Employee of the Year. And congratulations to Anita and her absence. And just before, is that okay if we take a minute yeah. just before? Okay. Yeah. So those were all of the, the nominees uh, for Employee of the Year. So each of the departments uh, made those nominations. The, the, that employee that, that did the exemplary, you know, one of the employees that did the exemplary work uh, throughout the year. And so uh, that, you know, that's, that's a really difficult uh, group to have to choose from. Uh, to have one that is the Employee of the Year, but, uh, but we got to do that, right? There's got to there's be somebody that gets the Employee of the Year Award, so that's where we're going to go next. <laughs> okay. So the 2022 winner is Anthony Benitez. Thank <laughs> <laughs> I would like to invite um, DA Tim Ward and Chief Gregorovic. Up to, up to the um, to the platform to say a few words. She mispronounced Tim Ward, right? <laughs> Ward. Hi. Good morning, uh, Chairman Tausman, uh, the um, Board of Supervisors, Mr. Britt, Ms. Flores. I'm Linda Gligrievich. I'm the Chief Investigator of the Bureau of Investigations, which is probably all the way at the very back. I, I don't even need to turn around. Uh, congratulations to all of the um, employees that were nominated for this big honor, and it's my honor to describe the employee of the year. We kept that a good secret from you N until the end here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was handed the, I was handed the plaque. Yeah. <laughs> Criminal investigator Tony Benitez is the epitome of what happens when hardworking experience is combined with vision. Investigator Benitez began his career with TCSO in 1992, working his way up to the violent crimes team. In 2006, he joined the Bureau of Investigations. And Tony was our go-to person for violent crime felony investigations, gang investigations, and witness relocation uh, matters which is very complex, and he was very good at it. So that's the hard, part, hard working experience part. In 2012, he was assigned to the Digital Forensic Unit, which honestly, I don't know that we can call it a unit because it was one person and it was him. And it was in a dimly lit office in the very back of the juvenile courthouse. You remember it well. Uh, he had three forensic computers, a folding plastic table, which had to be supported and leveled by a small piece of wood under one of the legs. It was not an auspicious start. But one thing cops are good at is getting the requisite training to learn what they don't know, and Tony did that. He trained and trained and trained and trained. His forensic acumen increased daily, and it was clear we were on a rocket ship for what he could do, and that's the vision part. He learned not only where he could take this knowledge, but also the goals for a real unit. More than one person, we have three now, a real office and a real laboratory. It's taken a few years, but I invite all the members of the Board of Supervisors to tour our office at 211 and see firsthand what Tony and his team can do. Tony is a sought after instructor now 
like literally right now, he's supposed to be teaching over there at HR, um, but his partner's covering for him. He's a post-certified post master instructor and he teaches locally on modern digital uh, privacy laws, human trafficking. He teaches dis digital forensics for the Department of Justice Cyber Crimes Training Program. Tony began with this with a, just a cursory amount of digital forensic knowledge and working on a wobbly tabletop with three computers to building a state-of-the-art lab with nine computers, a kiosk for local law enforcement to operate for cell, their cell phone um, evidence. Digital, he has a digital forensic investigator, Charles Clark, and another criminal investiga investigator, Chris Porter. All three have a commitment to continuous improvement and share this hardworking, experienced investigator's vision. Thank you for recognizing the good work Tony has done in 2022 and actually throughout his whole career. Thank you very much. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, they put it on a plaque. I don't know what the deal is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, certificate of recognition presented to Anthony Benitez in honor of being recognized as the, as the 2022 Employee of the Year. We commend you for outstanding achievements and service to the District Attorney's Office and the residents of Tulare County. Congratulations on this bestowment. That's a good word, bestowment. Bestowing this upon you. This is signed by all of the supervisors. Congratulations. And then stay up here and we're going to have all the food. Yeah. 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 Keep inching to the right. Yeah. 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 All right, thank you. Perfect. Let me stay up here. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, okay. We're going to have all the board come down for a photo. Come on down. Actually, and let's have all of the, uh, the nominees come back up, all the certificate recipients. If you're still here, come on back up for a photo, yeah. There we go. You only had one with Larry and I, so you need the whole group. And that concludes our presentation. <laughs> Okay. Yes, Supervisor Vanderpool. Mr. Chair, I know everyone's walked out right now, but uh, I just want to just say show. real quick to uh, all of the employees, every single one of you really is deserving of the Employee of the Year Award, which is why you were nominated by your department. Um, so difficult to choose just one, but I appreciate all the work that all of our county employees do, but especially you to be recognized by your employee or by your employer, your department head, your supervisor, to nominate you from a, a group 
of outstanding employees to be that cream of the crop. I hope that you take great pride in that and realize that is so difficult to rise to that level. Um, you are to be commended, and uh, I hope that you will continue to uh, work for this county and be a mentor and a role model to others so that we end up with a, a lot of outstanding employees that will be nominated in the future for Employee of the Year. So thank you all, and keep up the great work. All right. Very good. Very good. Okay. All right. Well, next is item number four, public comments. So members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda under state law matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the board at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public is invited to make comments when the item comes up for board consideration. Uh, anyone addressing the board will be limited to a maximum of three minutes so that all interested parties will have an opportunity to speak. So with that, Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up to speak? Mr. Chair, I have no public comment cards, but I do have an email public comment that I will now distribute to the board. Thank you. And as she is distributing that, is there anyone in the audience this morning wishing to address the board? Only one at a time. <laughs> okay, very good. Last call. All right, we'll close the public comment time. And we are going to go to our consent calendar before we get to the public hearings. So on the consent calendar, items 7 through 28, uh, do any of our, uh, any of the board members have one? Yes, Supervisor Shuckling. Um, I'd like to just comment on item 8. Okay. 8 for comment. Anyone else? Or anyone in the public wishing to pull one for separate consideration? I don't. Yes. If, uh, Supervisor Shockley wants to make a comment sure, I just, specifically about that item, I, she can do that before I'll make a motion to approve. Very good. Thank you. I just want to thank the auditor's office for working with the CSAC Finance Corporation and uh, for the easy smart pay. You know, this is something I encouraged for a while, and I appreciate that. I think uh, for a lot of folks who don't have their property tax bill included in their mortgage payment. This is a great opportunity to not have, it's good when the property taxes go up for us, but for some folks, uh, it can be a hardship for, so being able to do that in monthly installments, uh, I think will be a good thing. So I encourage, I, I appreciate you getting out there and, and letting the folks know that this will be an option. That's it. Great, that's, yeah, thanks for noting that. That is, uh, that, that is a great service. All right, any other uh, comments in before? Hearing none, uh, there's been a motion by Supervisor Vanderpool, seconded by Vice Chair McCary on the consent calendar. You can cast your votes. And the consent calendar is approved unanimously. So now we will go uh, to our 9.30 timed items. And it is 9.50, so before we open the, uh, the public hearings, can I please have the clerk provide instructions to members of the public on our procedures for today's hearings? Thank you, Chair. To members of the public, if you wish to, to provide public testimony in person, please complete and submit a comment card, provide your name and agenda item for which you will be providing testimony. There are two public hearings listed on the agenda today, agenda item number five and six. Please clearly state your name for the record. Your statements will go out on the live audio stream and will be included in the audio recording of the meeting. The timer will be set to three minutes, so please adhere to the time limit. If you choose not to participate in person, you may also participate by submitting an email as this item is being heard. Email should include the sender's name for the record. Email should include either agenda item number five or agenda item number six. Email should be sent to the clerk of the board's email address at clerkoftheboard at tulerycounty.ca.gov. Public testimony will not be read, but will, meet, will be made part of the record if received before the close of public testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We'll now take up agenda item number five, a public hearing to consider zone change ordinance number PZC22-011, Martin Hine, and the public hearing is now open. And we'll start with staff's presentation today and then take board questions and public testimony. Aaron Bach, good morning. Yes. 
Thank you, uh, Chairman Townsend, Supervisors, CAO, Council Clerk. I am Aaron Bach, Assistant Director with the Resource Management Agency. And before you today is a simple zone change from AE20, Exclusive Agriculture 20 Acre Minimum, to C2MU General Commercial with a Mixed Use Overlay uh, to allow other businesses and related agriculture to uh, related to not related to agriculture to utilize the existing office building. If you've ever driven past this one on Demery in 272 and wondered what it was, it's an old uh, ag service use permit that was only allowed there for ag services. So to allow them to do something else, uh, we're just changing it to C2MU. No greater plans are prepared for the site than that. The project area is located within the Visalia urban area boundary and the land use designation is Valley Ag. The city of Visalia commented during the project review committee that they would be satisfied with the mixed use zone on this property. Uh, the RVLP score for the property was eight. That concludes staff's report. If you have any questions. Any members of the board have questions for staff at this time? I don't see any, and so this time we'll take public testimony from anyone in the audience who wishes to speak. Each person will have three minutes. Is there anyone wishing to speak this morning? Yes, okay. <laughs> it looks like there's, pardon me? Nobody left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's nobody left. All right. Uh, hearing none, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any emails from members of the public? We have, we have none. All right. So there being no more public testimony, I'll close the public testimony portion of the hearing and bring the matter back to the board for discussion and action. Any board members have questions for staff or wish to take uh, more time to review the material or go to closed session? None, none, none. All right, then I'll bring it back uh, for final board motion. We have a motion by Supervisor Valero, a second by Vice Chair McCarry, and you can cast your votes. And this item passes unanimously. All right, at this time we'll take up uh, agenda item number Sarah, six at public. Can we close pardon me. public? No. <laughs> yes, and we'll close the, close the public hearing on that one. All right, I was, I was on a roll too, I was just going. So, okay. <laughs> All right, we'll take up agenda item number six, public hearing to consider PZC 22-002, amendments to Tulare County Ordinance number 352, sections 15 and 15.7, and the public hearing is now open. And we'll start with staff's presentation and take board's questions. And we still have Mr. Aaron Bach. Yes, uh, Chairman, Supervisors, CAO, Clerk, and uh, Council, I am Aaron Bach, Assistant Director with the Resource Management Agency, and before you today is uh, a text amendment uh, to uh, ordinance number 352, which does include section 15 and 15.7. And this is related to ADUs, junior ADUs, and a density bonus. Um, no, it changes to the density bonus ordinance of the county. Uh, Senate bill number 897 uh, was uh, amending California government code section 65852.2. 65852.22 and adding section 65852.23, which requires the county of Tulare to amend its zoning ordinance to comply with state law. The state of California has recently amended rules and regulations pertaining to ADUs, accessory dwelling units, and junior accessory dwelling units. The California Department of Housing and Community Development requires the county to amend its zoning ordinance to comply with state law. Uh, the state of California has recently amended the density bonus law and as such the county's density bonus ordinance is required to be amended to incorporate these re recent revisions. To give you a little bit more background of why we're doing this, we are going through the pro-housing certification process, which they keep adding requirements to as we've gone through it for the last two years. Uh, but one of the gateway requirements was that these two uh, ordinances be updated. Uh, for the county and also as a preliminary matter for our housing element review which we'll be getting to here shortly this is also a gateway matter for our housing element review and that's uh, that's why we're doing this um, the proposed accessory dwelling unit junior accessory dwelling unit ordinance changes upstate's uh, second unit ordinance to read as a ADU ordinance and junior ADU ordinance. It allows ADUs and junior ADUs to be ministerially permitted 
and RA, RO, R1, R2, R3, MR, and proposed uh, for the PDFM zones. Anything that allows residential basically would allow ADUs and junior ADUs. This allows the accessory dwelling unit to be rented separately from the primary residence, but not to be sold separately from the primary residence. Any accessory dwelling unit that is created according to the proposed ADU ordinance and is used for rental purposes shall be rented for a term of longer than 30 days. So these will not be used for short-term rentals. Uh, limits the number of junior accessory dwelling units to be one per residential lot within a residence built or proposed to be built on the lot. Uh, <clears throat> the ordinance will allow a junior accessory dwelling unit to be included separate, uh, have separate sanitation facilities or may share sanitation facilities within the existing structure requires the residence where the junior accessory dwelling unit to be permitted shall be owner occupied, either in the remaining portion of the structure or newly created JADU. It limits the size of the JADU to no more than 500 square feet and uh, must be contained entirely within the residence. Uh, the dentist Density bonus ordinance changes. Uh, the addition of the uh, density bonus for housing development uh, is in now to include for foster youth, disabled veterans, homeless persons, and college students to be consistent with state law. The amount of the density bonus is set on a sliding scale based upon the percentage of affordable units of, at each income level as shown in the density bonus chart. In addition to the density bonus, the county will provide one or more incentives to each project that qualifies for a density bonus. The number of incentives is based on the percentage of affordable units. Affordable rental units must be restricted by an agreement with set maximum incomes and rents for, for those units. The incomes and rent restrictions must remain in place for a 55-year term uh, for low or lower income units, and that's pretty consistent with our existing density bonus ordinance. Uh, so a couple of final notes, uh, of course, a public hearing, and the proposed updates will be in effect 30 days after adoption. If you have any questions, that's staff's presentation. Board, do you have any questions? Yes, Supervisor Valero. Yes, so several of my colleagues in other counties have shared with me that um, floor plans are made available um, to anyone who comes in and asks for them, or um, do you anticipate that we will also have that readily available for anyone who comes in, maybe to provide some consistency around the county with those kind of requests uh, and making it a little bit easier for them to then ask that at the counter at the, um, in the department? Uh, to answer your question, yes. Uh, to give you a little bit more background, we presented at uh, Fresno State with uh, the cities of San Diego and Los Angeles, and they have those uh, documents, uh, specs you can pull uh, off their website. So I think we're gonna cut and paste one of those over on our side and utilize those. The other advantage is we will be able to do over the counter, if they do follow those specs exactly, over the counter permitting or online permitting, where they will receive a streamlined evaluation so they wouldn't go through our regular building permit process. Granted, we only seen really three or four of these yet. Uh, hopefully that picks up a little bit. But yes, those will be made available to the public. Great, thank you. Other questions? All right, Aaron, excuse me <clears throat> for asking a couple of questions. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the sewers, we're, we're going to allow to use existing sanitation facilities. Uh, are, how are we gonna reevaluate? Because we're essentially we're gonna add at least one bedroom. Uh, uh, yeah, so as far as environmental health, yeah. uh, environmental health will, uh, um, Again, the, it will be a streamlined permitted process, and so, but they will at the same time have to go through the regular channels. So uh, well, environmental uh, health will get a bite at the apple here. So okay, so if, they're, if they have an, a, an existing septic system that was sized for a three bedroom home right. for the county standards and then they're adding a fourth, uh, are they gonna go out and verify that that's <laughs> sized properly? Well, again, that, that would just be the quick ver verification. I don't think they'll have to go through all the testing that you would normally do for a second mm -hmm. building unit, but uh, they, they, it'll be up to environmental health at that point to re require that or not. 
Okay. And I, and I had the same question or a similar question about uh, the fire sprinkler systems. Uh, I used to size those and, you know, sometimes they were on the minimums, uh, especially on rural uh, housing. So if you add a another unit that has a, it's going to need the same pressures, are we going to have to re-verify that? Well, well, the law tells us we're uh, not necessarily supposed to if they were sized back then, but I think if it's in the SRA zone, uh, that trumps. So at that point, we would be able to, fire department would be able to verify that as well. But okay. Again, it's, uh, it is a concern. But uh, for the few amount of units we have coming through as ADUs, because most of the time they do want to uh, sell or rent a family, or uh, we, we <clears throat> at that point we have the full power to use all of our powers, especially if they come through uh, as third residences or something like that as uh, uh, use permits. So this will be a kind of a unique situation where something's already residentially zoned and uh, that uh, they'd actually use the over-the-counter ADU process. Okay, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm getting a little bit in the weeds, but I want one more, one more thing. Uh, our percentage of coverage that we have, our lot coverage, um, because all the, you know, let's say, you know, when a subdivision or when somebody put a home on, they had their, they could go to, I think, a maximum of 55% lot coverage, uh, and now we're going to just, we're gonna be able to plop one of these ADUs or JADUs on there, uh, so that's going to, you know, increase the lot coverage beyond our, so does this ordinance adjust that as well? This uh, ordinance would trump that, uh, so. It'll just uh, overshadow it, so. Yeah. Okay, so if that, having said that, if someone's doing a new subdivision, what do we do with lot coverage? Do we still stick with 55 or do we allow it to go a little bigger? Well, if, if someone's doing a subdivision right now and not applying for the over-the-counter ADU permits, the, the law would still be the same as far as the uh, floor area ratios. Um, but again, this is the unique situation where somebody's actually coming for the over-the-counter kind of permit and not, uh, not necessarily going through the whole subdivision process. Um, of course, we could always, uh, if the subdivision is, well, I think that's what you're getting to, the subdivision is uh, built with this in mind, um, then uh, of course we would, uh, as I said, this would, would trump. And so uh, then at that point they would be able to build within that setback. Okay, because that's the one thing that doesn't, it, it doesn't really jive in my mind. It's like if, if we have a reason, and I think we do have reasons, to, to have maximum lot coverages, um, then the state comes out with a law that says, hey, you can just plop another home on there, essentially, a little studio. Uh, which increases those coverages, it seems like now we're saying, it seems a little clunky now because in one place we're saying you can, you can cover the lot 80%, but a new person out there trying to develop something can only cover it 55. So it seems like we need to make some sort of a acknowledgement of that, that, hey, you can go 55%, but you can also go more if you call this thing an ADU or a JADU. I don't know. Uh, right. Seems like we need to be consistent. And it's not our fault. I know it's the state overlay, but. Uh, yeah, and, and we could look into, so a little bit more background. Through this pro housing certification, we'll, we'll be back here a few more times cleaning up our, you think? our ordinance as they <laughs> change uh, their minds at HCD on how they want to uh, regulate these uh, new housing programs. But the, uh, um, I, I think there is, uh, Acknowledgement by the people who do ADUs, the, the few that have done them, uh, exactly what you're talking about. Um, but I think that staff themselves can tell people as they go through the process of all the options, especially as a project review committee, um, and they can keep the ordinances separate. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry, I took up all that time. <laughs> You think? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. At this time, we'll take public testimony from anyone in the audience wishing to speak. Anyone? Anyone here? Looks like none. Any via email? Nope. No emails. Okay. So, no more public testimony. I'll close the public testimony portion of the hearing and bring it back to the board for any other questions for staff. I've done all mine. Okay. And it's on closed session. Any need for closed session? No, okay, I'll bring it back uh, to the board then. So I will make a motion to approve. All right. We have a motion by Supervisor Valero, a second by Vice Chair McCarry. And if you cast your votes. 
passes unanimously and that will conclude agenda item number six and the public hearing is now closed. Thank you. All right, let's see where we are here. Did that, we did that. All right, we'll go to, to items not timed. Item number 29. Request from Resource Management Agency to declare the existence of an emergency within the meaning of the Public Contract Code, uh, Paragraph 1102, and Public Resource Code, Paragraph 1060.3, due to the damage of various roads in the county and bridges, yes. and all kinds of other stuff. Good morning, Reed Reed, yes. Good morning, Reed Hankey, uh, Director of the Resource Management Agency. Thank you for having me here today. Um, it's obviously been a busy couple of months and it's going to continue to be busy for the next uh, few months or into the years. Um, obviously we've had a, a, a massive amount of storm damage uh, from the, either the January or the March 2023 storm events. Um, and there's quite a few requests in this uh, agenda, um, but in a nutshell we're trying to find some ways to more effectively, quickly, responsibly deliver the projects and the repairs that are vastly needed out here. The, the first two requests, we need to establish the nature of the emergency per public contract code. Uh, we do have a county declared disaster, we have federal and state declared disasters, but under public contract code to uh, find some shortcut methods through procurement, we need to declare uh, the emergency here. Um, the actual definition is a sudden unexpected occurrence that poses clear and imminent danger requiring immediate action to prevent or mitigate the loss or impairment of life, health, property, or essential public services. So that's a public contract code's definition of emergency. Uh, the third through sixth items on there, um, we're asking your board to approve and ratify previously executed contracts, amendments, and change orders. These are contracts that were let out during the emergency. Um, we've been working closely with purchasing during the activation of the Emergency Operations Center, and we're now transitioning the, uh, the public works parts of the, the response uh, over to RMA. So this is a bit of cleanup related to that. Um, the seventh and eighth item, we're asking for the board's authorization uh, to delegate to future agreements or to uh, authorize future agreements to be bid under the expedited procedures, which are outlined in public contract code, um, and approve the CEQA emergency exemption. And then finally, we have to come back every uh, two meetings to you to provide an update on where the projects are at to uh, comply with public contract code so that we can't just go off on a tangent without your board uh, authorizing that or approving it. Uh, obviously massive damage throughout the county. Our current estimate is nearly $46 million in damages. This is of the total $55, $56 million that the county has accrued. So the majority of those costs are uh, damages to roads and bridges that we're looking at. We've got about 200 locations with damages estimated greater than $20,000. Of that 30 locations with damages greater than a half million and about 14 locations with damages estimated greater than a million dollars. So a large amount of fairly large scale projects as well. Um, the county forces have been very busy. Our road crews, highly active, restoring and protecting infrastructure, but I think of them kind of as the Green Berets. They're out doing things, closing roads, and then moving on. Our contractors are the ones that are coming in and actually repairing or doing the majority of the work, and that's through uh, publicly let contracts. Um, so that's kind of what the majority of this is focused on here, this presentation or these requests are the uh, privately let contracts that are going out to bid. Uh, these next few pictures are not specific to my, my dialogue so much, but just some color and some images of what we're looking at out here. Um, so how did we prioritize or how did we, you know, take this map and identify what we need to do first? Uh, first priority was to restore access to those that were completely cut off. There were 11 locations where a county road was damaged and there was no other access. So this included um, places that have currently been restored access, such as North Fork and South Fork, we are over bridges and three rivers, the Thule Reservation, Reservation Road, 
Pine Flat via the Caponero Creek crossings, Ponderosa via M107, and Johnsondale via M99. Those locations have all had access uh, temporarily restored. Uh, currently, there's five locations uh, still without vehicular access from a county-maintained road. We're actively working on Mineral King Road, uh, Wishon Drive, and Redwood Drive off of State Route 90. Um, we're ready to go with contracts to go out to bid, but we just need access off of 190 from Caltrans, so they're moving that one forward, and we're working closely with them as quickly as we can. Um, and then we have Avenue 404 and M112, which are bridges that washed out. Um, there's overland access available to those, but it's through private property. Um, so the majority of the work that we uh, undertook to restore this uh, access temporarily uh, was done through emergency contracts, uh, typically on a time and materials basis or a general barely uh, written scope. Typically, as engineers, we like to have the plans, the specs, everything really detailed out. Here, we basically said, hey, we need you out there tomorrow, hit it and go, and then we watched them and we tracked them closely with their expenses. Um, so that's how most of this emergency category work was completed. Uh, materials were often procured directly through our haulers and suppliers that we had uh, current bids with. Uh, second priority, just another picture here, this is Reservation Road, but second priority is restoring access to the high volume critical roads where long detours are unacceptable for emergency response and other essential public services. So this includes locations like on the previous picture, M109 Bridge over Deer Creek. Um, in the agenda there was an error, it said over White River, but it's over Deer Creek. Um, these are locations where there are long detours, but they're higher volume roads, so it's uh, real important that we restore access there for emergency services, et cetera. Uh, Avenue 280 Caldwell near Farmersville is another busy road that we just couldn't stand to have closed for any extended period of time, so we uh, approached that with emergency response procedures. Um, these projects were bid with a little bit more scope, um, not so much the time and material thing, um, but there were no plans and specs associated with it, so it was written, hey, we need you to go in and fill 500 cubic yards of material, fix the bridge, et cetera. Um, so a little bit more development because we did have a bit more time on those projects. Generally, though, they did not include the full permanent repairs, so like on Reservation Road here, we need to go back in, provide asphalt, more embankment, slope stabilization, drainage improvements, et cetera. So first response was get in there and get access restored. Um, another picture here, this is up in Three Rivers. Um, between those two priorities, we've contracted for over $6.1 million, um, and we have another $2.5 million in contracts pending your authority today, so we've been moving aggressively. That's a, that's a big spend for the Roads Department in one year, and it happened in a matter of days, really. Um, we're, and this is important to emphasize, we're hopeful that this will be uh, reimbursed through FEMA. There's no real guarantees with FEMA until the money shows up. So um, we've taken the strategy of get it done, um, get it open quickly. That's the priority. Uh, do everything we can to make sure that reimbursement's coming in, but we, we can't just wait and, uh, until that absolute happens. So um, these future contracts are also that we're looking at today or in the future are still at risk for being deemed non-emergent or um, for a, a variety of reasons, FEMA would say, hey, we're not paying for that or we're not paying for all of that. So we have to recognize that we're taking this at risk, but they are vital uh, county facilities and we just can't uh, afford to, to not go forward with it. Um, so that's important to note. Um, as we get into permanent repairs, these are the repairs. So this picture here is up in Pine Flat area, Capnero Creek. Again, emergency access is restored, so there's no uh, uh, landlocked parcels there, but we do at some point need to come back in and provide the permanent repairs. We're looking at 25 to $30 million worth of projects, and these need to go through the full design, bid, build process, and that ensures us or gets us closer to a, a certain FEMA reimbursement to do that. Um, we do expect them to be fully FEMA eligible. So these projects may take 12, 18, 24 months. Part of that is the going through the FEMA timeframe. Um, just for sense of scale or a sense of timeline, we're currently working with FEMA to set up the January storm kickoff, which is part of their procedure. So March will be, the March storms will be in June. We need to formally submit application on that. So we're still working through it there, but it will take a little bit of time. 
Um, these are projects like Mineral King Road, the permanent repairs. Uh, we've got contractors up there today doing temporary, but we have to come back with the high dollar permanent repairs at a later date. Uh, M112 bridge replacement, paving reservation road. Um, we expect a large number of projects. So 200 locations, we're gonna bundle these together, but there's probably a dozen to 20 bidded projects that we'll need to go out for these repairs. So again, that's more than what we would typically do in a year with our general capital improvement program. So we're kind of doubling or a little bit more than doubling what we would typically do in a year of work. Um, this delegation here provides us an authority to do these um, at a shorter time frame, probably take two to three months out of the process of going to a full bid, go to your board, uh, prior to bid, go to bid, and come back for authorization. So it does uh, expedite things quite a bit to do this. Um, they may not be considered emergency by the standard of we just have to get in there, there's no access, but they're no less urgent. We're taking them very seriously and we're um, trying to get out there because these are important roads to the people that live in these regions and use these roads. So they're very urgent to us and we're taking them quite seriously. Um, last slide there. So uh, we need to be, we need to f push on this, but we need to be fully aware of budgetary and cash flow consequences. We can afford the roughly 10 to $11 million within our road fund reserves um, right now, but as we get into the, the higher dollar projects, um, if we're not reimbursed, it will negatively impact future road projects and maintenance operations. So that's something we've been working through. Um, we're, I'm real confident that FEMA will come in and help us out here, but we have to be cautious of that and cognizant of that. So we need to follow their, their rule book to, to make sure that we are eligible. Um, that's really it. I do want to say thank you to the county departments. County Council was big in kind of identifying this expedited uh, mechanism through public contract code. And then the, the folks at the purchasing department who have really were there on day one when these bridges and roads started washing out um, and now kind of taking that hand off from them. Um, RMA staff, you know, obviously our road crews are out there, but kind of the, the office staff here, these are the inspectors, the engineers that are designing these projects and working them through the pipeline. Um, really appreciate their efforts. You know, they've been working just as long hours as the crews that were actually out there in the rain and in the mud. Um, and then the public, you know, this, thus far it's been massive. I can't understate this, how understanding and patient people have really been, you know, they get it. Um, but we're you know, we're 60 days, 70 days in now, so we're gonna, we've gotta make some progress on this, and I think we are, um, but I continue to ask people just to, for that uh, extended patience, and um, you know, we, we're trying to keep people aware of where we're at with this work, but um, thus far it's been really almost completely a, a good response from the public that we're able to get in there and do this, so I really do appreciate that uh, perspective from everyone. Um, so with that, happy to answer any questions or again, I appreciate your support on this. All right, we have uh, Supervisor, or Vice Chair McCurry. Reed, first of all, I wanna thank you and your staff for just a tremendous job. You <coughs> guys were just inundated and, and you kept going. So I, I, everyone worked really hard and we noticed it and thank you. Uh, you touched on a point about, you know, if we're not reimbursed, then obviously that funding could uh, impact future projects. And, and that's what I wanna ask is, these roads, I mean, we know these roads are starting to blow out and it's a result of the water damage. Have we accounted that? Is there anything that FEMA can do to reimburse us for any future damages? Because we know that the flooding in these certain areas are gonna continue to blow these roads out. So uh, kind of a bit of a loaded question there, but yeah, so pictures up on the board there, I'll use that as a good example. This is uh, Manter Meadow Crossing in Pine Flat. With the FEMA recovery project, they allow a certain amount of increased capacity. So we know that that culvert was undersized. Obviously it blew out, it couldn't handle water. So we can upsize a little bit there. So that's kind of future proofing. Um, for a road that was submerged, if it was a well-maintained road in good condition and we can document and prove that, then they would pay for the damage there. So that's considered damage to the storm. Um, for more just, let's say, proactive approach to future repairs, if nothing got damaged in this set of storms, it's a, it's, it's a FEMA program, but it's a different program, hazard mitigation. Um, so we've, the, we've thus far only tried it on two projects and been unsuccessful. 
Um, unrelated to this, they were more uh, drought and groundwater recharge type projects, but those are more challenging. So there's not a lot of, and they're, they're somewhat competitive as well. Um, so that is a little bit of a harder ask. If there wasn't, if we're not talking about a location that was specifically damaged to kind of more proactively go out and repair that, FEMA is a bit more uh, tricky to walk that line through. But for the roads that, that were damaged, I mean, so I say 46 million, there's still roads that are, we're going out and assessing um, that have been uh, inundated with water and we can demonstrate that they were damaged through that storm. So that may help us with just what we would think of as our traditional maintenance projects or an overlay project because the roads potholed up. So we're gonna try that avenue as well. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm just curious, I mean, I, I know that the road I'm driving on is fine and then within a day or two that it just blows out and I know, I know staff is going out and repairing those and obviously this road had been underwater so we know there's gonna be a continuing damage and I just didn't know Obviously, they have a deadline when we can file damages, and mm -hmm. so I didn't know if there's anything for the future, but it sounds like it's going to be a tough uh, tough road. That circumstance is a bit of a tough ask because I, I don't know exactly which road you're talking about, but I can guess it's probably not a newly paved road. Right. So if it was in moderate to poor condition to start with, they're real hesitant to provide any funding for that. They're going to say, no, that's kind of where it was already, unfortunately. All right, thank you. Yeah. Supervisor Vanderpool. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple things just to reiterate uh, comments that uh, Supervisor McCarry already made. Your staff have been going above and beyond doing a great job in the response. This is really a monumental task and you're doing fantastic work. Uh, number one, I think it's very important that you communicate. Uh, obviously, uh, we know the public has been incredibly patient up to this point, but we need to provide status updates and I don't know if it's signage, if it's you know mailings, posting uh, on the website. We need to make sure that uh, the public is aware of the work that's being done uh, and also uh, general timelines as to uh, when that work is being uh, completed or uh, into construction. I know that uh, uh, there were a couple of bridge washouts in uh, District 2 that I've been uh, questioned about on a regular basis. and. I just wish there was a more public way that we could get that information out there, number one. And then number two, um, I know that uh, we have looked at uh, advancing money from uh, Measure R before in the past. Um, there may also be some internal borrowing capacity as well. Uh, I know that we want to make sure that we get this work done just to make um, these roads, bridges, thoroughfares, whatever it was, passable for public convenience and public safety uh, bases. So you know, we need to put all, all options on the table just to make sure that we're getting back to, I'll call it normal, as quickly as possible. Um, so appreciate the work that you're doing. Appreciate County Council thinking outside the box, but uh, uh, let's continue to be innovative and find ways to, uh, uh, to move forward. And um, it's just a, a real shame that the FEMA process leaves so many question marks out there um, because these are truly uh, uh, repairs that are necessary as a result of a disaster. Uh, and you would hope that uh, uh, the understanding is a little bit more lenient uh, uh, from FEMA uh, given the circumstances, but you know, that, it, that remains to be seen. So uh, I'll, I'll be like you and, and have high optimism and uh, high hopes, but uh, I'd rather have a check in the mail or in the bank. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, to, in response to your point about uh, public information, you know, we've been scrambling just to get to this point, but I think we're in a good position now where um, a, a posting or even a specific website on the web page regarding these repairs and these damages would be useful. It's We've got timelines now, we've got uh, more concrete estimates, uh, photos of the damage and everything, because there's even locations where people are calling us up and I can't get up there, what's it look like? And just a photo like this to show them, yeah, that's a legit problem is, is gonna help them out there. So we'll take that uh, that guidance and uh, go, go back and put something together there. Um, I don't, by no means want to imply that FEMA isn't supportive. They've been here, they've been helpful. Um, it's just working through the process and it's, frankly, it's new for most of us. We haven't seen this level of damage um, for the roads before. So again, we're optimistic, but we need to keep in the back of our mind what would happen if we were out on our own for this. We'll go to our CAO, Jason Britt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just in response to Supervisor Vanderpool's question, uh, between Reed and I, between the road fund and the general fund, we've identified 
the county does have the ability to cash flow these repairs pending a FEMA reimbursement. Um, with that being said, that you know, hopefully re FEMA's reimbursement process doesn't extend beyond their normal timelines, which is 12 to 36 months. Um, and so we will be able to move on these projects, pay for them, get them done as RMA is able to get to them or identify contractors to get to them. So um, we, we will be cash flowing those projects and being able to get them done. A good, uh, it's a good testament of the um, uh, financial stability the county's in, that we could weather something of this size. Um, I do echo some of Reed's concerns about how much money we're gonna actually get back, but that's another, um, you know, still too early to tell, and we'll fight that uh, battle when we, when we get there, but um, FEMA has been on the ground. They have been helpful. Um, they have engaged in uh, sort of providing us technical assistance to maximize uh, reimbursement, and, uh, and frankly, it just comes down to who audits the file at the, at the end of the day. Um, and not necessarily the folks who are here on the ground. Thanks for that, and Supervisor Valero. All right, so I just wanted to share, because um, when we had the meeting last week in Three Rivers with FEMA and SBA, uh, in terms of private assistance, uh, a representative from FEMA did mention that Tulare County has received the most, which is 50% of all counties that are on the list of emergency. So uh, just want to share that, again, not to the point where we would like it to be, but know that Tulare County is first on that list for those receiving um, funds to support their private assistance. Very good, okay, and I'll, I'll just echo those, uh, pretty much all the comments and questions, same ones that, that we have, but thank you for all the, uh, you know, the efforts above and beyond, and uh, I know we all, all five of us probably call you all the time and, and bug you, and, uh, right. but uh, yeah, you know, just, just that's just uh, the nature of where we are, that we're all trying to get, get through it, but we do, we do appreciate all the work that you and your staff are, are doing on this. Any other uh, questions, comments before we, oh, yes, Supervisor Valero? many times over, but again, thank you for your around-the-clock work. Um, I know that there are times that I, I get emails at like 6.30 in the morning and stuff uh, from, from you all because I know that you guys are committed to the work and seeing it through. Uh, I know there's challenges along the way, but uh, I think that, um, again, you are steadfast. Your department, RMA, is steadfast in the work that needs to get done. You understand that and you're working diligently to uh, keep moving forward. So again, thank you on that as well. All right, thanks again, Reed. Uh, do we have any public comments on this item? I have no public comments. Okay, anybody in the room? All right, seeing none, I will bring this uh, back to the board for consideration for a motion. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Vanderpool, second. second by Supervisor Valero. Let's cast our votes. And this item passes unanimously. Thank you, thank you, Reed. And that takes us to item number 30, board, uh, board matter request. Uh, any board members wish to uh, refer an item to staff to be considered at a future meeting? I don't see any, okay. With that, I will look to Madam Council. Do we have a need for closed session today? Yes, Mr. Chair, there is need for closed session. Items A and B are off calendar. The balance of the agenda will be heard and I do anticipate an announcement out. Thank you, Madam Council. And uh, with that, then we will, uh, we will go into closed session and the meeting uh, will be adjourned at the conclusion at the, of the announcement out. Thank you for coming today.
open it back up. Okay, we will uh, we'll come back into uh, the chambers for the announcement out, and we'll turn to uh, Madam Council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jennifer Flores, County Council, announcing out for item E. The Board of Supervisors authorizes the defense of individually named defendants, including those to be named later with a reservation of rights. In the case of Jason S. Hunahan versus Jose C. Villasenor, U.S. Eastern District Court of California, case number 1-23-CV-00163-EP-2023-2023. EPG The adverse party is Jason S. Hunahan. This case involves a violation of civil rights. Motion to approve was made by Supervisor Pete Vanderpool, seconded by Supervisor Larry McCary, and the motion passed 5-0. That concludes today's report out. And with that, we will adjourn the May 16th meeting of the Tulare County Board of Supervisors.